Hi, everybody. Thanks. Uh, we're just about to get started here. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Holly Campbell. Holly is a Disney Fulbright uh, fellow, and she's doing some work here on uh, NBC on uh, water pollution. Uh, in fact, all the way up and down. Right. Now, before I introduce Holly, I just wanted to tell you what this is all about. Uh, the camera and stuff here. Um, the Andrews Institute is looking at a new delivery model for broadcasting the colloquium. Uh, right now, we're doing it over Collaborate, uh, where we can do audio and we do the slides. But uh, it'd be really nice to have some video as well. So we're just testing out a system. Hopefully, you just forget about it after a couple of minutes and focus on Holly, of course. And that'll be easy, I know. <coughs> now, Holly. Hello. <laughs> Holly is coming to us today from, uh, oh, by the way, thank you for agreeing to be our guinea pig here today. Uh, Holly is coming to us from Oregon State uh, University. Um, as I mentioned, she's a business Fulbright scholar. And uh, she at Oregon State teaches courses in ocean, coastal, and fisheries uh, law and policy. So a lot of her interests are, are around um, coastal environments and, and water resources in particular. Um, she's interested in land-ocean interactions and human influences <coughs> on, uh, on these uh, resources as well. Uh, she tells me she's very passionate about community engagement <coughs> in the quality and the quantity of water, uh, which I think is something that we can all probably appreciate here in BC. Uh, we're in the midst of a Water Modernization Act, and there's a lot of talk about the use of water in different parts of the, the province. So. Uh, very topical, I think. And Holly, uh, sorry, Holly has. Sorry. <laughs> See, I'm nervous too. <laughs> uh, Holly has held uh, internships with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the EPA in the states. Uh, and she's currently writing a book on non-point source water pollution, uh, an interdisciplinary approach, looking at uh, ecological processes and uh, coastal effects and human interactions. She is a Buddhist. She's a writer, gardener, fisherman, artist, anything else? In that order? Uh, a mom. A mom, yes. Uh, and she's, by the way, she's very interested in, in knowing what there is to see around Prince George. Uh, I mentioned ancient forest, uh, a couple of other things. If you guys have any ideas, please let Holly know as well. Uh, so, without any further ado, I give you Holly Kennedy. Thank you so much. It is really a privilege to be here and to share my work with you. And um, before we get started, I also want to say, besides collecting interesting places to go, I'm also collecting your expressions because I love old sayings and um, my host came up with a good one the other day. She was throwing something away and she said, this one's had the biscuit. <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> and so I'm writing all these down. I just love that. I don't know if that refers to last, last rites or, or what. <laughs> but this one's had the biscuit when it's time to go. That's a good one. So um, the photograph is of Dixon Creek, which is uh, beyond the fence behind my house. Um, and the people in their mid-80s and 90s in my neighborhood remember a time when you could actually catch very large salmon in this creek, which is almost unthinkable to us because uh, if you find a crayfish or a small red chiner, you're, you really feel lucky. There are water striders and uh, some water insects and um, spring chorus frogs. You can hear them. I never see them. Um, but other than that, it has been severely channelized, and the photograph was taken after a very uh, long period of hard rain, and you can see that it is filled with mud and sediment. So um, it's largely become a conveyance for stormwater. And let's see, was there something else I wanted to tell you about that? I guess that's it. If any of my students ever put as much text on a slide as I've done for this whole show, <laughs> I'd flunk them. So you're going to have to bear with me because I've been working on this in the one way or another for 10 years. 
most intensively the last three, and I'm very excited about it. When I worked at EPA, my family just laughed all the time because I'd come home, I wanted to tell them about manure management and fertilizer, and they'd say, God, it's so boring. How can you get off on manure management? I said, but it's really cool, the stuff that is happening in the Denmark and the Netherlands and so on and so forth, the stuff that community groups are coming up with to um, reduce their uh, pollutant load is, re is really amazing. So it is very exciting, and I put too much text in. So I'll just take a minute to walk through this. Um, I'm going to go through how I got interested in this, because I wish everyone would always start their talk that way. Um, what is a wicked problem uh, defining uh, how we categorize pollution, how it got there and where it came from, um, physical on-the-ground strategies to deal with it, management approaches, uh, Canada and BC, and implications of what I alluded to in the abstract about the new marine mammal uh, research coming out of Vancouver. Um, I'm going to, I assume that all of you live in a house or an apartment. I'm going to kind of give you a really short uh, synopsis of best management practices that you can do to um, reduce stuff flowing off your lot. Um, and then we will return to weather nonpoint source pollution, which I will refer to several times in the talk as NPS. It's even that way, it's too much of a mouthful. Um, is a wicked problem. I've never settled on the really the ideal term for this kind of pollution. In Europe, they call it diffuse. I really like that, but I've had a lot of Americans and Canadians tell me they don't like it. Um, maybe it's too amorphous or whatever. I love sheet flow in physics or hy hydrology. Um, I also like runoff. You don't even need to say polluted runoff because if it's runoff, it's going to have something in it, even if it's only dirt, right? Let alone candy wrappers and whatever. Okay. So when I was little, I was really fond of taking the hose out. This is about age three and putting it on a trickle at the right next to our house. We were on a very slight slope down to the street. I put the hose in a kind of a flower bed near a hedge of boxwood and a beautiful old uh, ash tree. If the water runs long enough, it begins to braid and form little um, maybe quarter inch deep erosion gullies and the soil particles and sand sort themselves and then make patterns, different colors. Um, and kind of braided patterns. I was making a miniature watershed, I think, in reflecting on it later. The picture of the um, honeysuckle berries is to remind me to tell you that I would go into our neighbor's yard and the stems of this plant are very delicate and fragile. You can pluck just little sprigs and poke them in the ground and they look just like bearing apple trees. So I had little orchards, houses made of bark and stones and so on and so forth. And it was like being, you know, up in the sky looking down on a watershed. So like many people, I've always been fascinated with water, how it moves and um, its properties. I'm fond of saying I like to work in the gap. What that means for me is that I'm, it must be some kind of terrible hubris. I want to span the gap between science and law. That means by nature, my work is extremely interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary. That doesn't mean that I'm an economist or, or a chemist um, or a hydrologist. That means that hopefully I can read and enjoy their literature and know what kinds of questions to ask and help convey their findings to a larger audience, namely policymakers and decision makers at all levels. That would be my greatest goal. This also means cross-sector, working um, with people from agriculture or from the power industry or uh, residential homeowners and so on and so forth. Um, 
And that in itself is one method of ecosystem-based management. It's not just looking at holistically at the ecosystem, but also at the governance, governance structures. So I think that's enough about that. So the term wicked problem, some of you may know, comes from Horst Rittel's and Mar I think it's Mark Weber's 1973 paper in science, uh, policy sciences, um, called a, a general uh, theory on the dilemma of planning. By now, it's been used to describe uh, lots of different kinds of problems and has moved well beyond uh, human health and human services, um, and is sometimes even used to describe climate change. I was worried that this would be too dark, and it is. I circled the little knight. He's a knight with his lance raised, uh, trying to take on this sea monster. That's us. Were the night, I mean. So the characteristics of a wicked problem are that it's essentially wicked. It's seemingly intractable. Um, I think that 30 or 40 years ago when we were um, passing groundbreaking water quality legislation in Canada and the United States, Maybe the world seemed ever so slightly simpler. We would choose a problem, work on it, improve the outcome, and move on to another problem. Now it seems that we're faced with environmental problems that are tangled up like a big 17,000 balls of yarn or something. And the only way to approach them is by, to me, a systems analysis, kind of looking at um, where we can best gain traction in the pathways that lead to the problem. That means usually having a table full of people from all different um, academic disciplines and also agencies from local to national and industries. Um, one of the things about non-point source pollution is really kind of a persistent lack of, if it isn't a lack of will among decision makers, it's a lack of knowing where the inflection points are. Very difficult to identify where you can get, gain the best traction. Um, some of the issues that I identified as being connected is when it costs more to treat water and provide it um, than we are charging. Um, if we have subsidies for fertilizer or for corn, those can uh, also exacerbate fertili excess fertilizer applications um, or ethanol policies. There's a good developing body of literature directly tying um, the growth in ethanol subsidies to watershed degradation in especially, of course, corn belt areas. Um, I would add to the list of wicked problem characteristics that they are ubiquitous and or invisible. And we can think of many other examples of things like this. Um, I think lead paint and lead in gasoline before we knew the harms it caused, many toxins are like that. Uh, exposure to the sun and sunburn, many things are very commonplace, and so we don't really look at them until we uh, start to see effects. Are there any Joni Mitchell fans in this room? OK, fantastic. Um, I am showing you a picture of oil or gasoline on water. And that is just a little tip of the hat to Joni for her, I don't know what year, early 70s song, Michael from Mountains, where she says, um, there's oil on the puddles and taffeta patterns that run down the drain. <clears throat> In colored arrangements that Michael will change with a stick that he found. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, so it's ubiquitous and invisible. <laughs> Thank you. No, I promise I won't sing anymore. <laughs> um, it's ubiquitous or invisible, but once or twice it gets into the popular consciousness. The other one is um, 
Uh, the sky is crying. Look at the tears run down the street. Is that blue sign? No? Okay. Thank you. Very good. Um, okay, so the categories we used in 1972 only go so far. Point source, as many of you know, refers to pollution that comes out of a pipe. So it might be industrial effluent or the effluent coming out of a uh, municipal wastewater treatment uh, plant after it's treated and going into a river. Um, Non-point source pollution happens after rain, snow melt, or irrigation. We can um, see that there's water flowing. We can see water puddling or pooling, and water picks up lots of things in its path, as I've already said, um, sediment, uh, pet poop, uh, pathogens, bacteria, chemicals, uh, fertilizers, what have you. Point or non-point um, to me are not fixed categories, and sometimes insisting that is not really very conducive to a solution. Um, and I wanted to give you some questions to illustrate that. So stormwater, in some towns stormwater drains straight to the drain. And I can um, remember when I was a kid, sometimes my dad would pour leftover gasoline or turpentine down the storm drain. I'm sure you've known people who've done that too. And nobody thought anything of it at the time. As my um, environmental law professor and former EPA employee John Bonine is fond of saying, the solution to pollution is dilution, right? If it gets dilute enough, it's not going to hurt anybody. That was what we thought. Um, in increasingly, uh, stormwater is being combined with sewage. If you have a, a downspout that goes underground, that's what's happening, most likely. And then it's treated at the treatment plant. Um, however, I'm sorry that this illustration is so awful. I had the worst time finding a photograph of a combined sewer overflow after a torrential rain. It's ugly, and it's scary, and it's not something apparently we want photographs of. But you can see the kind of uh, turbid area coming um, down is where the sewer plants have been overwhelmed and raw sewage has been dumped directly into a waterway. OK, agricultural runoff. Is it point or non-point? It's flowing across the field. It goes into a tile drain. The drain discharges into a ditch or a river or whatever. Um, if we're lucky, it discharges into a man-made uh, farm wetland designed specifically to filter what's in there. Um, under the U.S. Clean Water Act, agricultural wastewater is a pollutant by definition. However, agriculture is exempt from the act. So here we have um, an inconsistency right in the legislation that could help. Um, in the 1970s, the Cuyahoga River was on fire and Lake Erie was dead. And the very best thing that we wanted to do was to go after point sources. And in fact, that was a very good policy choice because in Canada and the US since the 70s, water quality has largely improved because of this. We left non-point sources to another day. And as our population and our development have grown, um, it has become far more of a prominent problem. Sources and pathways. Um, the more we develop uh, our rural, urban, suburban areas, the more we tend to cover them with concrete and asphalt, which are not permeable. So the water is funneled uh, in greater volumes at greater velocity velocities and does not get a chance to permeate soil and be filtered that way. Um, so that's a picture of Vancouver. And then the um, stockyard is for me to remind myself to tell you that the one small exception to agriculture's exemption 
are confined animal feeding operations, so stockyards over a certain size, so many head of cattle, um, have to have a plan in place by law uh, to, for storage and treatment of manure, and they are regularly inspected. So um, a really quick list of sediment, of contaminants and impacts. Um, I'm only going to go into a couple of them. Sediment seems really kind of innocuous. I mean, it's just dirt, right? I know there are probably a lot of fisheries biologists and so on here. Um, it makes the uh, water column very cloudy. It can prevent submerged aquatic plants from getting enough sunlight. Um, it can smother spawning beds for salmon and other animals and um, really choke a stream with uh, too much sediment. Um, fertilizers are actually <coughs> natural in small amounts. Nutrients are very important in nature. However, in large amounts, they uh, the word eutrophication actually means overfed. I love that in Greek, overfed. So um, it, it actually takes the phytoplankton explode in their population as they die and sink to the bottom. They suck water out of the water column, so um, there's far less dissolved oxygen, and anything that can swim away does. If it uh, is sessile or lives on the bottom, it usually is de dead. Uh, pesticides and herbicides, copper and other metals. Um, very important study done in Seattle in the last 10 years or so on um, brake dust from roads washing into surface waters uh, containing too much copper and impairing juvenile salmon's ability to find food. Um, apparently this led to brake manufacturers changing the way they make brakes. Uh, I have not found a direct proof in the literature of that. Somebody told me this story at a water quality con conference, and I met this, the scientist who actually did the salmon study. Um, let's see, I think that's enough on that. So the whole purpose is to either prevent it, slow it down, or filter it. Um, or uh, slow the velocity. So some cities have disconnect the downspout campaigns. Portland, Oregon is one such place that's really experimented with this. That's where you create an area with rocks and plants uh, where the water from your roof is redirected, and these can be actually quite beautiful. Also, stormwater retention ponds or constructed wetlands, um, engineered solutions, or again, connecting the stormwater to the municipal plant, but that has drawbacks. So I wanted to show you some examples. This is a rain garden in British Columbia. Very beautiful uh, use of native plants and lavender and so on. This is very hard to see. I apologize. It's actually a farm riparian buffer. This is a wetland restored and kept intact on a farm and geese. And this is a grassed riparian buffer along a creek. This is a photo I took right off of Tyner near where I live. It is a, a storm water retention pond and you can see how much sediment flows off the pavement from this big hump right here. And um, that's actually OK, because any of you who know much about wetlands know that the uh, most transformative processes happen in the gradation between wet and dry, not in deep water. So when, the, when there is sediment exposed periodically to the air, that's where the bacteria are working the hardest. There are actually a pair of ducks. I'm not sure if they were, um, they looked a little like mallards, but I'm not sure, uh, male and female. They're there every single time I walk by. So um, you might ask, 
What would happen, this must be municipally owned, I would think, but what would happen as this piece of property becomes more and more valuable? It's on a corner that's heavily developed, so it seems like it's prime real estate. But I thought it looked pretty well done, and I thought it was also very beautiful this time of year. So there is no silver bullet for non-point source pollution. The best we can hope for is a combined approach. Um, it's not just a top-down, government-sponsored program. Um, really mandatory uh, laws and regulations are of limited but of some use. Where communities are finding the greatest traction is through grassroots groups. And there are many examples of this. One is Tampa Bay in Florida. There's also um, a watershed group in Ontario where uh, farmers got together. They felt that they were about to be re heavily regulated, as they already are on many other fronts. And they wanted to lead change rather than be dragged behind. Um, they have, in Ontario, the problem was nitrate in drinking water in dangerous amounts, and they changed their farming practices and brought the nitrate down to um, allowable levels over a much faster time period than they thought it would take. Um, because of something called hysteresis and the nutrient cycle, nutrients are just recycled over and over and over again in aquatic systems. So it's not as if you are going to do bioremediation and have it disappear overnight. Um, in some, it always depends on how much of a load there is. So for example, wetlands are excellent for treating nutrients as long as they're not overwhelmed with volume of nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, let's see. So Canada is very supportive of reducing non-point source pollution, but leaves it to provinces and municipalities to craft solutions. Um, this is very similar to, to the United States, and I always wonder, because I've heard people at the state <coughs> level say, we do not have the personnel or the money to go after this kind of a thing. So um, that kind of suggests maybe a wider set of people at the table. You'll be happy to know that Canada's water quality is very good overall. And um, in this report from Conference Board, it ranked fourth out of uh, 17 countries. Uh, the United States is fifth from the bottom. I was pretty chagrined to see that. And I know I'm pretty certain what's driving it. It's the uh, hypoxia in the Gulf coming from the upper Mississippi River Basin. So Environment Canada collects data from 173 monitoring stations. That seems very few, doesn't it, with a country this size? But they're strategically placed in the most populated areas. And these are the results for a two-year period from 2000 to, uh, 2007 to 9. Um, so it looks like if I were them, I would be, wor I would be keeping an eye on the 41% fare to make sure they don't go down and find out what is causing the impairment. So they went on to say, poorly treated municipal waste, industrial effluent, and fertilizer runoff from agriculture are uh, composing the greatest risks. Most of the nitrogen and phosphorus released into the environment comes from these three sources. And again, a reference to when we went after point sources in the 70s, we've really cleaned those up. Okay, so um, in 2006, effluents produced by households, businesses, and industries generated 84% of the water effluents reported under national pollutant release inventory. This is really due to two reasons. One is that most plants in Canada, the United States, and the developed world are way beyond their life cycle capacity and, and their capacity. So they're 
they were only designed to you know, work for 50 years and they're now at 80 or 90 years or in places like uh, Louisiana when it was hit by the hurricane, it, their water infrastructure is over 100 years old and it already had holes in it and is very expensive to repair or to replace. Um, so it's sewer, sewage overflows when the population in an area has grown and the plant was only uh, built to serve, you know, I don't know, a million people and now there are six million people in an urban watershed. Um, also, the level of treatment when the plants were built was probably primary or secondary and now um, the state of the art is tertiary. Um, so that's kind of a combination of problems with mainly old infrastructure, which is incredibly expensive. Um, I also wanted to mention that in the Netherlands, despite the expense, they took five old plants offline and replaced them with two high capacity, very efficient plants. I thought that was really interesting. Um, this is, again, the conference board. Municipal wastewater is composed of sanitary sewage. Don't you love that word, sanitary sewage? Sounds like an oxymoron to me. Um, and can contain grid debris, suspended solids, disease-causing pathogens. That's interesting for our marine problem. Decaying organic waste, nutrients, and about 200 identified chemicals. That leaves a lot to the imagination, doesn't it? There's probably all kinds of things in there we haven't even identified. Um, Canada, like the rest of the developed world, is experiencing increased toxic algal blooms in lakes and at the coast and increased nitrate violations in drinking water. That's mainly wells, but also um, other sources. So the approach to non-point source pollution in BC is advisory. There are, are some good handbooks um, dating from the 90s. And um, I couldn't help but notice that BC was Canada's third largest populated province. A lot of work was done on this issue in the United States and Canada in the late 80s, early 90s, and then it seems to have severely tapered off. In the US, it was due to politics and, and backlash. BC water quality is largely very good. Thirty-one sites tested. This is from 2007. Trends in water quality. I'm sorry, in order to fit this illustration on the slide, I left off the northern half, but I wanted to, uh, where the water quality is stable across the board. I wanted to show you the lower half of the province where most of the population lives. So you can see that there are a few places with deteriorating water quality. One can only guess that those could be due to urbanization and also agriculture. So the marine mammal study was done in Salish Sea off of Vancouver. Um, it, this area has been experiencing quite a lot of growth. Um, coastal areas all over the world are where humans live. I think in the United States the, the uh, figure is something like 3,500 people a day move to the coast. Everybody wants to be there. Um, so you can see that from 1981 to 2006 they added 900,000 people and um, by 2041 they think 1.2 million more will be uh, living there. I love this picture. This is not from Canada, but it is from Northern Virginia. And the reason I love it is because this is exactly the type of situation I was born into. My um, yard, I figured out much later because of the trees, uh, was part of a subdivision built on a filled wetland. There were a lot of willows, ash, uh, silver maple, a lot of um, wetland flowers came up in the spring and every spring our backyard flooded, uh, much to my delight. 
So there are ways to, to give us all room to grow and places to live, something called low impact development, um, making permeable pavement that can percolate and filter water, um, also higher density development. And a lot of these tools are being adopted in communities throughout Canada and the United States. So we don't have to keep replicating bad ideas or bad decisions. The coastal sediments, um, I have written a letter to someone who does coastal sampling to try and get it at where the data are located. I wasn't able to find any data on this that are published on the web. Um, this is very similar to Puget Sound off Seattle, the types of legacy chemicals showing up in sediments. Um, and. Uh, some of them are very worrisome. PCBs came from electronic parts, capacitors, and so forth, and are uh, known carcinogens. They uh, bioaccumulate and biomagnify up the food chain. Um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, when you walk across a parking lot and there's oil and gasoline on the pavement in the big spots, that all gets washed into the storm drain. It also comes from air deposition. When fossil fuels are burned, they go up into the atmosphere and then they come down either in dry or wet deposition and that is swept into uh, stormwater also. Um, the good thing is that most of them except PCBs um, are being found to be decreasing. I couldn't find anything after 2002. Uh, PCBs were banned in the United States and Canada in 1977 but there are still pieces of equipment out there with the old style equipment uh, parts. Um, and also, uh, as I said, legacy pollutants being released in sediments. So this is some of the research that got me so excited that I proposed to Fulbright Canada to do this project. I read that uh, marine mammals were washing up on BC shores and uh, investigations uh, found their cause of death to be diseases that normally affect pets, livestock, and humans. And I said, that sounds like non-point source pollution to me. Well, as we've seen, it also um, really smacks of sewage overflows or some problem with sewage. Um, <clears throat> this is very preliminary research by Dr. Katie Heyman, who is a vet veterinarian uh, and a postdoc with the National Institutes of Health at UBC, but uh, she has noticed the correlation between um, sampled sites showing high pathogenic uh, results and mouths of rivers. And so I'm, I really want to keep in touch with them about this. And if you're interested in this, I, I uh, recommend you kind of keep abreast of their research because it's fascinating. So that brings us to what can each one of us do? Because this isn't really um, Ottawa's problem, and it isn't really Prince George's problem. Um, all of us live here. We all like to grow uh, flowers or buy um, produce at the farmer's market or whatever, or fertilize our lawns. So um, there are, I don't know, hundreds of articles about best management practices, and my favorite thread within this literature is what gets agricultural producers to adopt it, what gets them to say, yes, I'll try it, and then not just try it for five years, but to actually transform the way they farm. Um, so we know a lot about what to do to keep these substances out of our surface waters and our groundwater. Um, an EPA study in Wisconsin and Minnesota discovered that established lawns don't need any phosphorus whatsoever, and yet it's been a constituent of lawn fertilizer for, I don't know, 75 years? Um, if you are putting in a seeded lawn, it needs a little bit to get it started, but after that, all it does is release it. It just flows right off your lawn and into the street and down the drain. So. 
uh, once the phytoplankton get uh, their hands on phosphorus, they go crazy, right? It's like, oh, now I can really live the big life and be overfed. So, and then that makes the thick green mats of algae on the lakes we like to fish in and swim in, and it stinks and nobody wants to go there, and your cabin is worth not as much or whatever. Okay, so I'm going to leave it with you. Is non-point source pollution a wicked problem? It kind of depends on where we're sitting. It depends on um, how much we care. It depends on how much we connect the dots of whether it matters or not. So I would like to uh, thank all of you and my hosts for bringing me here. References. This is going to be up on the web, right? OK. This is the Pacific Ocean off of Oregon. And I think that's it. That was way too long, I apologize. No, you were perfect. Was Excellent. it good? OK. A any questions for Holly? Yeah. So I'm just kind of curious whether there's kind of like an optimal scale to deal with problems. Watershed. Yeah. Yeah. Watershed communities. Like Fraser River Basin? Yeah, absolutely. Well, smaller? if they're really large, then you cut them into segments, like uh, the Chesapeake Bay many different management segments. And that's one of my favorite examples, but it's, there's so much written about it. You know, I didn't really want to, I could have talked too long about Chesapeake. It's kind of my country's poster child. And it's still very contentious, very full of controversy, but they are making headway. And the problem with it is not just, uh, you know, 200 years of farming and industry and transportation and multiple states and high population. It's also that the bay itself is severely constrained. There's not a lot of flushing or, or turnover or oxygen. So uh, it has built-in limiting. It's a perfect example of hysteresis. It, it could take 80 years or more. And so if you are part of a watershed group and you tell your constituents, you know, the nature of the problem and how long it'll take to fix it, they'll follow you. But if you tell your constituents, a couple years max, we're going to have clean water, and then you don't, you're going to see a, a real backlash. People are going to lose faith. They're not going to write checks anymore. They won't come pull out invasive weeds and you know join in your annual meeting and all those good things. Other questions? Yeah. With, for how people care with the availability of good water. So people in our area, for example, we have lots of lakes and clean lakes and wonderful water sources all around, compared to a place maybe in California where they have to import water from the Colorado River. Yeah. Is there a difference in how people view these problems? Yeah, there's Joni Mitchell again. You don't miss, miss it till it's gone, or you don't know what you got till it's gone, or whatever. I think that's part of the human condition. But we can learn. We're capable of learning. We've already shown that millions of times. Um, I think that my favorite example of that were some kind of wealthy resort owners in upstate New York who uh, the, one of the local soil and water conservation districts got a grant from the United States Department of Agriculture and said, you know, you're these big, thick al algal mats returning every summer, and, you know, really property values really were going down. They said, you know, there's a couple of dairy farms and some other small farms in the area. I think it was all family farms. I don't think it was a large industrial kind of a thing. Um, they said, we're going to gather a group of stakeholders together, and we're going to see how far we can get with best management practices. And so they thought, they told everybody, look, this is really bad. It's going to keep cycling. And even if we stop all the manure and fertilizer going in tomorrow, it's going to be a long time. And everybody said, OK, we're good. So I think the grant 
only la lasted five or seven years. But within, they took pictures and they took, you know, they monitored. Within three years, the water was clear and the mats, you know, they measured how, s how much smaller they had become. So um, sometimes, if, you know, and it depends on the soil, the substrate, and, and other problems, the deposition from the freeway or whatever. Sometimes if nature is given just half a chance, it has amazing chemical and uh, bacterial uh, systems that can transform anything, even PCBs, into something that's harmless. So um, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> anything else? Novi. So I was looking at one slide about improving water quality or the deteriorating water quality. And there was one dot on the Vancouver Island, right by the Capitol River. Uh, the water quality was de deteriorating. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, that's uh, from marine source or the fresh water source from terrestrial habitat? Do you, do you have any idea? You know, I don't, but I'm going to meet Katie for the first time in about three weeks, and I'll ask her if she has any thoughts. And being a good scientist, she'll say, I don't have any data on that, <laughs> right? I, you know, coming from law and policy, I can tell you this is a, an educated guess, and I can talk all day long about what I think. But if, if a lot of people are moving to the island and there are houses there, it's probably a mix of things. If there are, you know, everybody wants their organic milk and cheese and ice cream, there's a beautiful dairy farm up there, but they're doing things the old-fashioned way. Everything's washing in, into the Campbell River, right? I don't know enough about that area. Does anybody in here know much about Campbell River? or its current status? Well, I guess I was uh, asking the question because, you know, salmon farming is one big issue in that area. Okay. So I that's wasn't quite sure whether non-point source pollution is from terrestrial source or something from aquatic uh, source like a Well, there's a problem with the terminology again, unless you, you know, uh, under the Clean Water Act, a point source is also a conveyance, a discrete conveyance. Don't you love that? It sounds like a very Victorian. A salmon enclosure or a cage, that's a discrete conveyance, right? There's animals in there. Well, I'm arguing, I'm, you know, I'm arguing it could be seen as a point source. I think that aquaculture is an industry that actually has a lot of rules and regulations. So if this, you know, and that should be pretty easy to find out, you know, what proportion of that pollution is salmon related, I would think, in the monitoring. But I will ask Katie. That's a great question. Anything else? Yeah. Just sort of referring back to that map you had again, um, and the ranking of Canada being so high up there, and so few stations doing monitoring, is that our lack of knowledge reflected in there? <laughs> is that our is that, lack of knowledge yeah, reflected? Yeah, we just not know maybe how bad some of our problems are because we have so few monitoring networks or, you know. Well, I want you to remember. How does that reflect, per, you know, precise? <coughs> the countries up there are rather small. Non-point source yeah. goes up correlated very well with population and urbanization. And, yeah. you know, if you're having in intensive farming like in Iowa, you know, you would normally think to look for it. But it was only for non-point sources. No, it was for all water That's quality. Yeah. Okay. So, anyway, just so. Monitoring is very expensive. And maybe one of the best ways around that would be like sometimes uh, the European Union or the UK offer a million dollar prize for a new technology that can deliver results quicker on a given question. I think if we had those kinds of stimuli, you know, everybody in this room, it's, it's a group of very intelligent people who care about issues. You get together in a research team and you design a quicker, like there's something called rapid assessment that a lot of cities use. The other thing might be to get citizen scientists involved, train them how to take the samples in their own watershed, train them where to send them, or hopefully there's uh, a facility close by, and how to read the results. I have never done this. I would love to know how to do this, and I've, I've asked. I sampled pulses of nitrate in a stream when I was working for EPA but I've never done actual water sampling. I had kind of a, an electronic 
a probe I was using. Any other questions? Well, it's really up to you. The water belongs to you. Water is a use right. It's not a property. It's, no one owns the water except the people. And the steward is the national and provincial government. It's just the same everywhere. You can't, I mean, you, can you hold water in your hands? It's all on paper. All I can say is that um, the two problem areas in Canada are off of Vancouver, and also in Alberta in association with the oil sands. So that, based on that, I would say that there's no deal unless there's um, monitoring state-of-the-art equipment safeguards. I don't have oil or gas pipelines where I live. And so it's easy for me to say this. It's a huge boost to the economy and so on and so forth. But I think it's up to you uh, what kind of permit conditions those folks have, and also um, a contingency plan. You know, if they're not, if the results are not satisfactory, what happens next? If there's a spill, what happens next? Because I know from the PAHs, it's very difficult once chemicals associated with oil and gas are released into the environment. It's like a Pandora's box or something. You know, we want, we want the benefits, but we also have to plan broader. We have to plan for contingencies and um, safety, human public safety. We only have so much water. It's mind-boggling. All the water that was ever on the planet from the beginning is still here, and a lot of it is up walking around in us and wildlife and trees and, you know. But w there isn't going to be any more water than there is right now. There was a question over here. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a couple questions from the online, and I'm going to try and paraphrase just so that... Fabulous. ...comes through. Um, the first question... Okay, the first question, by reserve, does this person mean like a provincial park or something the government owns? I believe she means um, where... First Nations. First Nations. First Nations. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. Um, oh, my gosh. What a great question. I think that probably varies according to the tribe and their watersheds, but in general... I would think that the water quality would be a very high priority, and they are sovereign nations. So I don't know if they work on monitoring and enforcement in partnership with the national government or if they have their own. I don't know the answer to that one. But I do know that on federal lands, both in Canada and the United States, uh, water quality is usually not an issue because there the government's not concerned with land use planning or private property. It, they are sovereign lands, and they can take care of it from the beginning, right? Theoretically. <laughs> uh, I'll th here's a, an interesting wicked problem. Yellowstone National Park and um, some other federal areas, there, it, something about the air shed, there's so much particulate matter from urbanized areas from far away that that's impacting water quality. And you can't just go up and build a wall around Yellowstone National Park or vacuum up the particulates like cobwebs. But um, so that's why I always 
had to, had to qualify that. And the second question again? <coughs> Okay, yes and no. In less populated, less industrialized areas, uh, sometimes there is a huge amount of phosphorus in the soil naturally, and erosion by streams will break off huge chunks of that and carry it right down. And so um, there are different strategies for dealing with natural soil-based pollutants uh, to mitigate them. but. Uh, Normally, you, I think you can, except for air pollution again, um, you can probably assume that water quality in remote areas is somewhat better. Now, I used to love to drink from springs while I'm out fishing. Come across a spring, drink right out of the ground. Last summer, my husband said, no more. You can't do that anymore. I won't let you do that anymore. So he's too worried about groundwater because Again, we can't see it. It's connected underground. It can be quite vast and quite complicated. And he said to me, you don't know, a deer might have died a mile up. <laughs> yeah. So, oh well. So there goes one of my favorite activities. So one last question for you, Holly. Huh? Um, where are you coming down on the pricing of water? Like, there's been a couple of things in the news recently, Nestle. Uh, their extraction of water for, for drinking water and yeah. uh, the fracking up in the northeast. I mean, they get huge volumes of water for pennies. Right. Well, That's what excellent. should the price of water be? Okay, this is an issue about which I know this much. Um, I think that it first came to my attention with the Klamath Basin controversy over salmon under President George W. Bush when all the salmon came back and died because he uh, released water to the they plant hay and horseradish down there. It's very sparsely populated. And I became aware that the price of the hay was far less than the cost of the water. And I said, something's wrong here. This is really wrong. They're losing money. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But by God, they had to have their water rights. Mm. And a person, a water right in the West, you know, is sacred. And I don't own a ranch, and I don't grow hay or horseradish, so I try not to sit in judgment. But as I've tried to learn about this issue, I do uh, pay my water bill. As a matter of fact, it's due. I better go. <laughs> um, and I, they have increased it slightly every year because of this. We have a tertiary state-of-the-art water treatment plant. I'm lucky where I live. We also have a hell of a lot of water. It doesn't stop raining from September 15th to <laughs> April 15th. It just doesn't stop. And you saw my creek to prove it. Um, we also live in a heavily agricultural area where a lot of the groundwater wells are way out of compliance with nitrates, so dangerous. Um, I think that if we can figure out a way for people who aren't making it very well to afford their water, and the rest of us pay what water's worth. Yeah, I think we need to increase, increase the price of water so that it reflects what it costs to treat it and provide it. Mm -hmm. um, or to replace it once it's gone. You uh, usually can't. Well, there you go. Yeah, there are places in Texas where they turn on the faucet and nothing comes out. The aquifer's gone. Um, and also places in um, West Virginia where you turn on the tap and black comes out because of, um, what's that called? When you take the tops off mountains to get to the coal. Uh, topping? Yeah, whatever, <laughs> that kind of, that awful quick, quick buck kind of coal mining. It, it's been really wonderful to share my work with you and you've been incredibly patient and your questions are all great. Is there one last question anywhere? I was going to say, I won't be able to answer them, and I'll have to email you after I do some research. Well, ask, there you go. If ask you me the worst more, question you can think of. And you want to talk to Holly later, please. Yeah, please do. And I'm in 8-139, so you can come and knock on my door. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.